Cool. So actually, Eric, I spoke to you on the phone a couple weeks back. I think it was uh, you just so happened to be sitting in the call center. Yeah. 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 It was on a random yeah. day, and I saw the, the call screener phone blinking, which is different than the ACA number. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, all right, I kind of want to find out who that is. And so, yeah, we talked. I'm glad you called in. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, I was planning on calling in earlier, but I just uh, this was the first time I could get around to it. So um, I thought about kind of what I wanted to talk to you guys about, and uh, mm-hmm. so I do have some questions. Andy, shoot. Go for it. Okay, cool. Um, so... Something that has uh, occurred to me, something I think about a lot. I listen. I've listened to the Atheist Experience probably now for gosh, I don't know how long they've been on air, but I'm pretty sure I've been listening to. I think I know they've been on air at least nine years, I believe, because I've listened to them. I think the first time I ever heard them was about nine years ago. You ready for this? Um, yeah, go ahead. Are you gonna be mad if I say it first? No, do it. Okay. Uh, the Atheist Experience has been on for about. T- just about 21 years now, I think. It is okay. almost okay. of age to drink this fall. Oh, that's true. This wow. fall around Drunken the atheist time, experience. <gasps> around the time of the, um, the bad cruise. Dude, let's get drunk on air. Yeah. Let's do, you know Jeff, what? Let's Jeff, do it. Be, be, before we continue the call, I thought I remember that you were a religious person, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Did and, it not show that I am? I'm a- that's yeah, awesome. It shows. Yeah, cool, man. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, go ahead. I mean, here, not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so my question is, um, kind of uh, from your perspective, I, I like to, you know, I think a lot of times uh, believers spend a lot of time trying to uh, defend their own perspective, and I like to kind of try and probe atheists on where they're coming from. And so I think that for me, something that has occurred to me and something I, I have struggled with uh, from an atheist perspective is the concept of. Uh, human value, um, the value on human life. And before it, uh, I, some assumptions are made, I'm not saying that I don't think that uh, atheists generally uh, put value on people's lives around them or that they don't love people. That's, that's not where I'm going with this. Um, what I'm more kind of trying to get at is um, that from a theistic perspective, I'd say that I believe uh, human beings have intrinsic and like unique value that's specific to humans. Uh, but it seems to me from an atheistic perspective, you'd have to kind of default to this view that uh, human value is kind of, kind of just an evolutionary illusion that we've sort of developed over time that kind of just seems, seems to make humans appear to have value to us, but it's not a, an actual existential thing. And so I was just kind of hoping maybe we could have a dialogue about that a little bit. Yeah. Ooh, I, I want to go so historic on this one. I, I really do. I also just... By definition of value, I so go ahead and then I'll. I would I would just say when you say, but it's not like a real existential value. It's it. This is exactly like when people say, oh, but what does my life mean if whatever? So whether or not something is meaningful or has value is a subjective statement, right? You need sure. a subject that values something, right? Mm-hmm. I value other human beings, their lives and my life have meaning to me. And so, yes, I would say my life and other people's lives are meaningful and have value. But, like, if you ask, if you you asked Hitler, he would say that there are six million Jews that had no value, but I I value other people, and that's really all it takes to do good things. And and there are other ways to establish value, right? So, Mm -hmm. I mean, um, going back, um, we can look at Kant. And Kant described how we have value and, and, and treating each other not as a means to an end, but as ends in and of themselves, and treating people thusly, right? Uh, not using people. And then what that has to do with rights and the way that we talk about rights. Um, that is one philosophy uh, that, that has been described. Um, that doesn't necessarily rely on you know, uh, a specific God. Um, but moving forward, you know, th- the funny thing is, when I was a Christian, and this is completely my experience, I assumed people had value. And when I was asked, why do people have value? I said, well, because God gives them value, right? I, it, it wasn't a, an actual exercise. There wasn't a why. It was just a, you know, one of those just because things. 
And um, it, it wasn't until much later in my life as an adult that I decided that I was able to engage in those conversations because me engaging, uh, like, I, I had no reason to. I had my reason already given to me just because, right? The, the, the God says sure. so, and therefore it is. Um, but for us, if we don't follow that God claim, then it's just something in a book. And if it's just something in a book, then we're all already assigning value to each other. It's it, for us standing on this side of the fence, you're doing it too, right? You might be arbitrarily doing it and not having reasoning why, and you know, other than it's in the book, yeah. right? But we don't, we don't think that there's a, a, a God. And because of that, we're all in it together. And so I think that us having the discussion on what gives humans value and why we should value each other is much more, it has so much more meat on the bone. It's so much more fruitful when you actually engage on that other than saying, well, because it's in the book or because my deity says so. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and, and I see what you're saying there, but I think that that only works as a hypothesis. And let me give you a, a perfect example of what I mean by that. Sure. Um, uh, you know, there's a, I don't know if you're familiar with David Woods. He's a YouTuber. Uh, he's a pastor and apologist. And uh, he was a diagnosed sociopath um, when he was a young man, tried to kill his uh, father, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you run into people that are, you know, mentally deficient and are dealing with illness, what you have there is somebody that can empathize the same way. I don't suspect that somebody such as you guys here are going to say, hey, there's no, uh, I, I personally ascribe value, but that's, really just a chemical process in my brain that's telling me to do that. There's nothing outside of that that actually uh, objectively applies value. And so... so well, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Even if I jump on... You go for it, man. Um, literally everything that you see at the present moment is constructed out of chemicals. Mm -hmm. I know that this might seem like, I, ooh, a yeah. tiny detail, but literally everything that you've ever done or touched is chemical structures, and when it does something, that's a chemical process. Sorry, it's, it's yeah, kind of a yeah. thing with me, right? Like I worked with kids and they were like, oh no, there's chemicals in the cheese. And I was like, <laughs> actually, all things are chemicals, even that cheese, even your organic cheese, whatever. So the statement no, I, like, I'm oh no, it's just a chemical process. Right even if you believe that a God exists, for you to say it's not a chemical process would be for you to deny something that is observably true. So if you say what That's what true. You, yeah. yeah yeah what you what the point that I think you're trying to make if I'm understanding you correctly is without a god it's just uh, a thing that you are doing rather than a thing that you are being instructed to do by a mind that you are told never to question. Well, so not even not even that. Um, I, I'm with you, I, and I'm in agreement. Actually, Steven Pinker has a great quote about this. He wrote an article for the New York Times called The Moral Instinct, mm. um, and where he kind of goes into this concept of, of you know, the uh, morality kind of being the way he uh, sort of established is like a zero-sum game. Um, and if you guys are familiar with anything with game theory, which I'm, I've got a kind of a rudimentary understanding, admittedly, but, you know, it's just kind of we're in a win-win situation. We're trying to for all parties to win. Um, but, um, you know, I, so I'm, I'm fully with you. Like our di differentiation between colors and um, uh, fear, things like that are from a naturalistic, naturalistic presupposition, I would say, yeah, that that's all that it is. Well, you don't um, necessarily so need a... God here. I'm, I'm actually more, I think, trying to get to sort of an inevitable, I'm trying to get to a conclusion as far as with the, uh, with a naturalistic perspective or a materialistic perspective. Um, if I were say, uh, and, and this is my, my question. So if we're, I mean, would you guys at least acknowledge that I, I'm not saying trying to detract some type of meaning you guys are ascribing to your family, but would you guys at least say that this is something that has sort of been hardwired into your system uh, from an evolutionary process that took place over uh, an insanely long period of time. Some things, some things. Uh, look yeah. at mirror neurons. I would, I would also say, well, yes, but so sure, you're you're primed evolutionarily to do that. But there are people that hate their parents, and there are people that hate their parents because yeah. they are not great. So, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. So, so then I guess what I would ask is that. We're at a point where I would assume you guys believe we have evolved to a place to be able to 
have abstract thought. Um, well, and now that we're kind of equipped, would, would you guys say that or no? I, I mean, I have abstract thoughts. I, I think that abstract thought was not what, um, let me say that a different way. I think that it is a byproduct of the brain that we have that we're able to have this kind of metacognition and be able to uh, think in an abstract way, right? But I don't sure. think that um, there was a goal or a guided process. I think that is a byproduct no, no, of the system right. we have, right? Sure, um, sure. And so it, I, what I kind of want to touch on really quick before we move too far and then it becomes irrelevant mm -hmm. is the just mm -hmm. ah, yeah. part, right? Um, because okay, yeah, go ahead. Because you can do that for a lot of things, right? I can sell you on the idea that it's only meaningful when you drive a car to the grocery store. And so if I say it's only meaningful if you drive a car to a grocery store and you drive to your friend's house, I'm going to say, why? Why you're just driving to your friend's house, right? You never actually showed that it's meaningful only when you drive to a grocery store, right? And, and the reason that makes sense in my mind for this conversation is because what I'm saying is that there was this idea, this thought that, that is baked into the religion, um, well, most religions when it comes mm. to morality, is that there's an outside force that is describing, um, you know, in a supernatural way, meaning to things. And so it's only meaningful in this outside way. But if you were never sold on that idea in the first place, it doesn't make any sense, right? It's, it's a, sure. an add-on that we're sitting back going, you only miss it because you think you had it in the first place. Does, does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. And it does, and I, and I think that you're illustrating the point. When you're driving to the grocery store, that is meaningful because you have ascribed that meaning. If I'm a person that doesn't want to go to the grocery store. I don't need anything there. Or I, I, I feel like I hate the grocery store. I hate Walmart, for instance. And you're driving me to Walmart. I say, this is pointless. It yeah. really is. The yeah. only reason it was meaningful to you is because you ascribed that meaning. And so I guess what I'm trying to get at, though, is that we kind of paint this perspective with a very broad brush. And when I talk to atheists, they say, well, I would never kill somebody. I value human life. And that's great. I'm glad that that person can ascribe that meaning to people. But if, you were, if we're stepping outside of that, because there's a lot of people in the world that have a lot of different motivations and a lot of different perspectives on these things. And, and so I, I wanted to pose this kind of uh, dilemma to you guys um, because I think that, uh, you know, I hear like Matt Dillahunty and Aaron Raw and all these guys uh, who I would probably would say would fit the category of anti-theist. And they want people to kind of shed religion and adopt a secular viewpoint, which, you know, I think that if that's the, what the argument they're making, then, and, and that's fine, we need to investigate, okay, once we remove these, in your perspective, false presuppositions from our, our viewpoint, what do we have? And so this is what I would, I would ask. If we were to reset human history, re remove all of religious history, Right, and, and everyone were to kind of collectively agree that there's not a God and that a God doesn't exist. And we, we have the faculties for abstract thought that we do now. Ooh, ooh. Right? And we're trying to recreate these codes. Can I, can I insert something into your uh, hypothetical? Sure. You ready for this? Sure. If yes. everybody agrees that a God doesn't exist and there is no religion, then that point mm -hmm. makes no sense. Right? Okay, because, which... because I'm not going to say this thing you don't know about doesn't exist. Because it just, it just never was there in the first place. Sure, so, I'm yeah. talking about from our perspective here and now, as I'm saying. If we were to, just for the sake of communication here, you, you're <laughs> right. Let's say we were at some default where there isn't a God. We don't even know the concept of God. There's not even a word for atheist because it was never a concept to contrast it against, right? Okay, cool. Okay, I'm, I'm, say, I'm really on board with this hypothetical. <laughs> yeah, because okay, I was going to say, okay. then the word for atheist is human. Okay, sure. Let's just say we're all human beings. No concept of God has ever arrived on the scene. And we're creating a code of ethics. Mm -hmm. um, and we have the capacity for the abstract thought we have now, mm -hmm. right? Um, have you guys heard of the man standing on the bank of a river and, and there's a, uh, say, uh, an in, and, and there's two uh, creatures drowning? Have you heard this one? Uh, go ahead and present okay. it. I'm, 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 okay. So there's a man standing on the bank of a river, right? And he sees, as he's standing on this bank, a toddler drowning in the river. And simultaneously, right, he sees a critically endangered breed of animals, say an ape or something, 
right? And they're both drowning, but he only has time to save one. And in this scenario, right, the man is an animal lover. He's a conservation activist, and he, he rationalizes to himself. There's, you know, millions and billions of humans. There's only just this last few breed of ape. I choose to save the ape and let the toddler die, mm-hmm. right? Should the man be sub? First of all, I guess would he would he should he be subject to punitive action in this world? Because we're in, we're at this place of abstract thought. We realize this man didn't ascribe that value to the human. He ascribed it to the ape in this situation, and he had rationale for it, right? So he's standing before, say, court or, or whatever. What should this world? What kind of ethics should this world reflect to respond to this situation? Interesting. I you know I, honestly, I, I think that we live in that world, right? Yeah. And so because we live in that world, how do we ascribe things to it? Well, if you're talking about a child, right, the way our society treats children is different than the way we treat other adults. And so Mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, moral imperative situations, uh, we can we can do the trolley problem and we can have, you know, a whole bunch of different responses and we can all kind of figure out where we draw those lines. But what's interesting sure. is that if you have an ethical obligation or a moral obligation, right? Like, like let's say in your hypothetical, this person is the child's caregiver. Then if they chose mm-hmm. not to save the child, then that would be very immoral that because you have a responsibility to that child, right? If why? this, why? Well, I, yeah, I, I understand what you, right? Like if, like if this is their kid. What definitively or their niece or nephew or, sure. or, or, well, or you know, whatever the case but, may be. But objectively, there's not, a, there's not a difference in the value between your own child and any other ah, creature that lives. Yeah. There's but no there other, is. You see what I'm saying? Well, okay. There is. Yeah. Do you see, you see where I'm going with that? There's not yes, absolutely. Objectively. You ascribe to me, and that's your preference, but say you had evolved in a different way. Let's say that you didn't. It's, you were, you were so, an animal. So, that, so what if I told you that... The, that, okay. um, that we have studied this scientifically, right? Now, I'm going to do the worst possible thing, which is cite a study that I cannot think of the name of. And so if it's wrong, yeah. I will issue a retraction in the next uh, episode. But okay. from what I understand, the closer you are related to um, the, whatever the situation is. So for this, the, the closer you are related to that child, the higher mm-hmm. the chances are that you will save that child. Uh, even that, to, that, even at risking your I life. I can tell you the name of the study. Oh, good. I know the name of the study. It's called yeah. It's called choosing between the emotional dog and the rational pal. Uh, it's a um, uh, by uh, Richard T- Topolsky. Uh, he was the one who did the study. And and but the problem you have though is in that study, um, the what they showed though is I, I, and I'm with you, but 40 percent of people would have chosen uh, uh, their dog or even a dog. Uh, almost uh, half as much, 40, 40%, that's a substantial number. 40% uh, is still and, the minority though, right? Well, and we're also but, getting, uh, I mean, we, we can say the uh, same uh, thing about a certain result on a trolley problem is 40% versus 60% are going to say one thing or the other. But when you're getting to, I think the real meat there is the part that's, n- that's less arguable, which is, you know, that if this is your child, you know, not only yeah. would you go out of your way to save that child, but you would even put yourself at risk to save your child versus and, and that's true, kid. true. But but there's still there's a, there's percentages. I mean, when you're talking about so, billions of people, yeah. and you're talking about forty percent, that's still a substantial number. I mean, I realize percentage wise, it's a minority, but as far as just the 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 numbers that go, forty percent is is sub, very substantial. It is. To be I clear, what you I, run in. If I if I can yeah, if I can jump in here, um, uh, sure. Jeff, uh, that percentage includes people that believe in a god. So the problem that you're citing and and I think trying to get to with well, unless we have a person that everyone agrees can tell us what's right and wrong, then people might disagree, which is what no. uh, questions not- boil down to generally when in other conversations. Sorry, not. Yeah, yeah, I I phrased that very poorly and and, and miscommunicated just now. No, no, it's okay. What what I'm saying though is I recognize, for instance, that people can say can can believe a certain way. Like that poll may not represent what those people actually do in that situation, right? So I could be a a person who believes in God, and I say, well, I would definitely save the the child, right? So I'm in agreement. You're right. It does include religious people. I'm not saying that 
the ideology is necessarily going to be what is practical. What I'm saying is the consist consistency with the ideology. If we're uh, trying to form systems of judicial systems under a uh, perspective that there is no God, how do we have concrete laws? I'm not talking about what people will do. I'm saying we, we have them in the way that the United States formed them for the first century of its existence. But additionally, we have them by rationally evaluating what the result of a law would be in relation to what we desire, which is precisely the so, same way that we do it, if it, it was precisely the same way that humans do it, whether they believe in a God or not. There isn't any significant difference, except that sure. it can drastically change the results in such a way that the objective outcomes can be unbelievably painful and destructive to humanity, which is why a system well, that evaluates what the result of action A is that acknowledges that the world doesn't bend to the will of a being that we can't uh, test or know yeah, the will I'm of. I'm not making a defense for theism here. I'm trying to investigate. I know. I, haven't, I actually haven't brought up God here at all. I'm actually trying to delve a little deeper into this. Like I said, well, if we're... If, Jeff, I'm, I, I'm sorry to jump on you, but that's the reason that I am bringing up God. To point okay. out, these are interesting questions of morality. At the beginning of these, you sure. say, in a world with no God. And I'm saying in the yeah. world that we live in, that's well, okay. also, that and, is the case. Sure, and I'm, like I said, I'm trying to jump into your guys' perspective right now. I am a believer, okay. uh, obviously, I, I do, but if, I'm saying if I'm to walk away from what I believe now, and I'm trying to investigate what the ethics look like from here, what do, uh, I can go on what my emotions tell me, empathy tells me, you know, I love my wife, I love my kids, uh, I wanna do good, but if, but that's such a broad stroke. Once again, you're going to have people. They're going to rationalize things. Like I said, uh, Pinker in his uh, article, uh, The Moral Instinct, sums up morality as sort of a zero-sum game. It's uh, trying to weigh out things. Now, if we got into an instance where we're overpopulated, we're consuming a lot of resources, and somebody could rationalize that it's better to save this species of ape rather than the human being, I don't see how we can, apart from saying, hey, this is what my evolutionary, uh, this is what my uh, biology is hardwiring me to tell you. Mm -hmm. I don't see outside of that how you can actually make it's, a punitive action against that person and say, no, you've done something that is... Well, have, you, have you heard of the, the, um, the fallacy, the appeal to consequent? Um, I, I, I can't... Couldn't tell you what it was. Inform me. I'm, I'm, I probably couldn't. Sure. Uh, so the appeal to consequent is a, a fallacy because it relies on whatever the consequences would be to the statement, to the proposition, mm -hmm. um, to invalidate the proposition, right? So let me give you an example. If I said sure. left-handed people don't exist because if they did, mm -hmm. we would need to make uh -huh. left-handed scissors for them and that would be a pain in the ass, uh -huh. right? Um, what I sure. did there is I used the, the, the consequent of there being left-handed people making left-handed scissors. Yes, I see the look you're giving me, Jamie. <laughs> right? Um, I'm left-handed too. So. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but Eric. in this case, what I'm doing is <laughs> instead of speaking to the truth of it, uh, what I'm doing is saying, mm -hmm. man, if that was true, then it would suck. Right? Mm. Um, so mm -hmm. what I would want to do in having this conversation is to make sure that I didn't fall into that trap of saying, if this is true, then it sucks. What I would want to do is make sure that it still aligns to what is true and then what kind of uh, value I give it, you know, not as is, but as ought, right? What, what, not what it is, but what I think it should be or what that means, uh, you know, when it comes to morals or the way that we treat each other. You know, there are some things that I think I could make a case for that are moral, but aren't good in the long run, right? Sure. And because of that, I can say that, you know, they, they don't always line up. And it's a sticky, icky, weird situation, but it's something that I know I personally love to talk about, mm -hmm. and it makes me feel really awkward. And I know that we, we got to move on to the next call, um, and I'm going to sure. uh, bounce this over to Jamie, but I do want to tell you, Jeff, yeah. come to Texas. Come to Austin. Okay. I want to have a beer with you, and I want to talk all the way until okay. morning, and I will buy the first one. This is an awesome conversation. 
That sounds great. Hey, thank, I, I very much appreciate you guys letting me uh, talk with you. I'll probably call in again at some time if that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I would like to just say that Eric is right. For a second, I thought he was going to go in a different direction that I was going to have to have a problem with. But no, he's, he's right. So the objection that... <laughs> oh, God. Uh, uh, is insufficiently supported by evidence. But um, the objection that he's making, which is that, well, if there isn't an objective moral thing you know, that would be bad, therefore there is, is valid. But what I would add to that, additionally, is that the way that people discuss moral propositions and whether something is ethical is the same way that they discuss whether or not a movie is good, right? It's a value, it's a question of, of a value statement. And so you make arguments Perfect. on those basis in order to persuade people. And yes, sure. if you don't believe that there is an unbelievably powerful supernatural, what I don't actually know your specific beliefs, but compared to a belief that there is, you know, a monotheistic, all-powerful God that's got your back, compared to, well, actually, no, I'm on my own, the world looks like a very, very, very scary and sometimes lonely, terrifying place where you as an individual don't have the kind of willpower and resources that you can find in Minecraft when you're in that situation. But what I would say is, unlike in Minecraft, there are more than seven billion people on this planet. And I would rather have seven billion cousins, some of them are siblings and a couple of them are my parents, than I would have one person that will never speak to me that does terrible things to my entire giant family. What we have is each other, and I prefer that to anything. And that makes the world not as scary and not as lonely. I like that. That is the first. I, I, I thought, man, Jamie's going into the weeds. Jamie's going really <laughs> yeah. far into the weeds. He's talking about Minecraft. And then he uh, made it really yeah. sweet. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, well, Minecraft can be pretty sweet, too. So. Uh, Jeff, uh, we are going to move on. Yeah, but, yeah. But yeah, yeah that's fine. Do call hey, back. Thank you guys again. Yeah, I, I will. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I've got some more objections I think we could hash over. But cool. we'll save that for another conversation. And okay. for a beer. Get your ass to Austin. <laughs> okay. All right. Take right. care. Yeah.